When we address the issue of poverty, I, I think we really have to look at who benefits from poverty. And the fact of the matter is the wealthy folks benefit from poverty. So in a way, you might say that the problem is not so much poverty as the pro problem is wealth, prosperity. And when it's taken to an extreme, that wealth is used as the measure of value in a culture, which is what's happened in our culture. And in fact, it began happening 3,000 years ago. And we've been moving in that direction ever since, so that we judge ourselves, we ju judge our societies, we judge individuals by how much wealth they have. In order for a relatively small percentage of the population to have a lot of wealth, you've got to have a very large percentage of the population essentially acting as slaves. They've got to be impoverished. So as long as we live in a system that honors that, in a system that requires slavery, in essence slavery, uh, to move it forward, we're going to have poverty because it's absolutely to the advantage of the corporatocracy, of the people who control our biggest businesses and corporations, to have a mass of poor people around the world that they can draw on for labor, that they can draw on to steal their resources, whether it's oil or diamonds or coltan or whatever the resources are. And as long as those people remain impoverished, as we call it, then they're at the mercy of those of us with wealth and we get to exploit them. It's a sad fact of life that back in the 70s, when, w w when I was an economic hitman, you know, we had a gap between rich and poor, but today it's twice as wide as it was then. And today, more than half the world's population lives on less than $2 a day, which despite what a lot of people seem to think, isn't enough in almost any of these countries to, to live a decent life. It's, it's a slave wage, really, when you come right down to it in most of these places. It's gotten worse. We've portrayed this period of time since 1970 to now as being a time of, of development, of being a time when the developed world has invested huge amounts of money in the developing world in order to help bring it up. But the fact of the matter is none of that's happened. The fact of the matter is we in the developed world have gotten richer and richer and richer and more prosperous and more powerful. They in the developing world have become poorer and poorer and poorer. Now, the deception here is that if you go into one of the major cities in almost any of these developing countries, you'll see incredible skyscrapers, beautiful buildings. It looks prosperous. What you don't see is that beneath all of that, there's a lot more poor people and they're a lot poorer than they were before. So this whole idea of investing money in these countries and into the infrastructure and, the, and, and developing them hasn't worked from the standpoint of alleviating poverty or even reducing it. It's increased it. It has worked from the standpoint of making us richer, making the corporatocracy more powerful and richer. It's been a huge success from that standpoint. I think a basic question that we have to ask ourselves is, is who foments the system? And perhaps we have to then look at, if we are an empire, where's the emperor? Because there is no emperor of the world today, and the United States doesn't have an emperor, it seems. But in fact, we do. We have the equivalent, and that is what I call the corporatocracy, which are very few primarily men who run our biggest corporations, and through them they run, they, they control the United States uh, government and, and every other one in the world, too, that they want to control. And it doesn't matter whether in the United States we have a Republican or a Democrat in the White House or in Congress. There, there, are, there are details that make a difference, but from the standpoint of expanding the empire, it happens under, under both regimes because it's controlled by the corporatocracy. And, in fact, at the highest levels, uh, the people in the government and the people at the, big, at the top of the big corporations are one and the same. They go through what we call the revolving door. So one year somebody's president of a huge corporation and the next year he or she is secretary of state or vice president or even president. And so this system is controlled by what I call the corporatocracy. We can say without a doubt that this system is an absolute failure from the most rational, objective, economic standpoint, it's a failure. Less than 5% of the world's population live in the United States. We are consuming over 25% of the world's resources and creating roughly 30% of its major pollution. That's a failure.
That's not a model you can take to China or India or Africa or Latin America. <laughs> Simple mathematics tells you you can't, you can't repeat this model. 5% of the world consuming 25% of the resources you can't in China and India together <laughs> that, that, that takes us totally off the chart it's a failed system From a historical perspective, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting evolution. So for several thousand years, we had the idea of empires, kind of an accepted idea, and almost a, and it's a romanticized idea, you know, the great empires of history that were not only building empires, but spreading civilization. And, and that was the concept. And certainly the Spanish, the Portuguese, the French, the English, the Germans, the Dutch, as they spread their empires back in the, in, in the time of you know, the great discoveries and explorations that we call it, um, it was very obvious that they were spreading empires. There was no secret here. If you send your young men and sometimes women off to conquer other lands, everybody knows you're doing it. And it was accepted. It was accepted because, partly because these were small countries with very few resources internally. And the, and the, and the way for them to become rich was to go out and exploit others, labor and resources. And the other thing that was justified was it was done in the name of religion, it was done in the, in the name of culture, of civilization. We want to uh, civilize the heathens. And so there was all this theory built up around it, but it was out in the open. Everybody knew that it was happening. And then during the time between the two world wars and the time of Hitler and, and during this period, the idea of imperialism and the idea of colonialism began to take on a dark quality. And when we emerged from World War II, we created the World Bank the I, and eventually the IMF and the United Nations. And the, the idea was that we're going to create a different kind of a world. But as we came out of that period, we in the Western countries, led by the United States, I, I think, um, saw the new enemy as being communism, the Soviet Union. And so we created this, these institutions like the World Bank and uh, to reconstruct a devastated Europe. Very good principles behind the, the mission statement of these organizations that we would still hold today. But very quickly, they began to channel their resources into convincing the world, and particularly developing countries, not to go with the Soviet Union, to convincing the world that our system of imperialistic capitalism was better than the Soviet system. So in order to do this, these institutions became very friendly with, they developed very cozy relationships with the corporatocracy, with the big corporations. And this became stronger and stronger during the 50s and the 60s, and the corporations became stronger and stronger. At the same time, we launched huge, the, the corporations launched huge campaigns to convince the public that what's good for business is good for America and the world, and that, that really what we, you know, the American dream was to create a few very rich people, that that was part of the American dream. And greed began to be taught in business schools. And, 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 and it pervades boardrooms today. That's the objective, <laughs> make a few people very, very rich. And so the system began to evolve. But at the same time, we had this aversion to colonialism, to empire, to imperialism. We said we had an aversion. We didn't like what Hitler had done. We, we began to look back and say, well, what those conquistadores did, and the British, and the French, and everybody else, that wasn't good. But in fact, we were still living in that system. So. It started in, in, in Iran uh, when Mossadegh became, was elected democratically as president of Iran in the early 50s, and he began to nationalize oil companies, and we didn't like that. So we decided we had to get rid of him, and we sent in a CIA agent, Kermit Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's grandson, and, and uh, he was extremely successful at getting rid of this democratically elected president of Iran and replacing him with a terrible dictator, the Shah.
But he did it very quietly. He did it with a few million dollars and without much violence and without the risk of war with the Soviet Union. And at that point, we feared nuclear war with the Soviet Union. And so this sent a really strong message. This works. This is the new way to build empire. He was economic hitman. Kermit Roosevelt was, in essence, the first economic hitman. He was also a jackal. He was the two combined. But he was a CIA agent, a card-carrying government employee. And so very quickly we realized that that's no good. But if he'd been caught, we would have looked pretty bad. So we developed a new class of people, which were like me. We work for private companies, consulting firms, whatever. And we're economic hitmen. In essence, we work for the corporatocracy, the government. But we're not paid directly by them. We're paid by a consulting firm. So how does the system really work? You know, we economic hitmen have many vehicles to make this happen, but perhaps the most common one is that we will identify a country, usually a developing country, that has resources we, we covet, our corporations covet, like oil. And then we arrange a, a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. Now, most everybody in, the, in, in, in our country believes that that loan is going to help poor people. It isn't. Most of the money never goes to the country. In fact, it goes to our own corporations. It goes to the Bechtels and the Halliburtons and the ones we all hear about, usually led by engineering firms, but a lot of other companies are brought in. And they make fortunes off building big infrastructure projects in that country. Uh, power plants, industrial parks, uh, ports, those types of things. Things that don't benefit the poor people at all. They're not connected to the electrical grid. They don't get the jobs in the industrial parks because they're not educated enough. But they, as a class, are left holding a huge debt. The country goes deep into debt in order to make this happen. And a few of its wealthy people get very rich in the process. They own the big industries that do benefit from the ports and the highways and the industrial parks and the electricity. The country's left holding this huge debt that it can't possibly repay. So at some point, we economic hitmen go back in and we say, you know, you can't pay your debts. You owe us a pound of flesh. You owe us a big favor. So sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies. Or vote with us on the next critical United Nations vote. Or send troops in support of ours to some place in the world like Iraq. And so we use this whole process as, first of all, getting their money, basically, money we loan them to enrich our own corporations, and then to use the debt to enslave them, to imprison them, to get them to have to agree to selling off their resources cheap. It's an amazing system, and in the process of doing that, we have, in essence, created this empire, and we've done it without the military, without most citizens knowing that it ever happened. In fact, most citizens believe we've done a great thing. We've spent billions of dollars on building an electrical system, industrial parks, and so on and so forth. We've given this country a huge gift. And the truth of the matter is exactly the opposite of that. We've given this country, we've put this country in a terrible, terrible situation, a terrible predicament. A few of its wealthy people have made a lot of money, and they've, put, they've, been, they've invested in real estate in Florida or uh, Swiss banks or stock markets overseas, they've taken their money out of the country and they've become very rich and if something goes wrong in the country they just leave. 